Good morning guys and welcome back to Journey Across Japan, non-stop north. Now, for 21 days we're travelling around Tohoku, around the north of the country, and it felt wrong to take that journey and miss out one key place, a place that is talked about for all the wrong reasons. And I'm of course talking about the Fukushima Exclusion Zone, where we are right now. I haven't been here for four years, ever since I made a documentary interviewing some amazing people and hearing their inspirational stories. And I felt compelled on this journey to come back and take another look and see how life has changed in the four years since I was last here and how the situation has sort of developed over the course of the last decade. Where we are right now on the seawall is about as close as you can get to the Daiichi nuclear reactor. Quite literally, right here on the concrete, there's a big notice saying nobody beyond this point, nuclear disaster zone. This is as close as we can get today. Above all, I'm just grateful to be back here, uh, a place that's seen a lot of terrible things happen, but also a lot of inspirational stories as well. Following a magnitude 9 earthquake on March 11, 2011, a 15 meter high tsunami smashed into the coastline of northeast Japan, killing over 19,000 people and triggering a meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactor. In the days following, 154,000 people were evacuated from a 20 kilometer exclusion zone around the nuclear plant. But over the course of the last decade, rather than leave the area uninhabited, a $200 billion cleanup effort has been underway to bring the region back to life. And today, with 10% of the evacuees returned, local businesses reopened, and towns that were once practically abandoned now inhabited once more. The region serves as a beacon that despite the destruction of a tsunami and even a nuclear disaster, hope can prevail and life can go on. Perhaps the most poignant reminder of a town that once was is Ukedo Elementary School. When I visited the area previously, it was inaccessible and looked like it was about to be demolished. And yet today it's been reopened to serve as a permanent reminder of what happened 12 years ago. So it was at 2.46 the earthquake took place and 3.33 when the tsunami hit. And they were kind of warned that it would be about two or three metres high, but in actuality, the tsunami was 15 metres, insane, and it almost reached the second floor of the school. Now, thankfully, all the students made it out okay, and the head teacher received a lot of praise. A uh, combination of quick action and a lucky kind of truck that came past that they could get the students on to drive away. Unfortunately, the town of Ukedo itself wasn't so lucky um, and was completely destroyed. And this is the only thing left that kind of stands as a marker of what was once the town of Ukedo. And you get a real sense of the power of the tsunami coming through the school, and walking through the classrooms, seeing the ceiling collapse, kind of taps and things bent, like metal just bent completely. Thank God everyone got out okay. Walking through Ukedo serves as a haunting reminder as to just how quickly the 2011 tsunami changed the lives of those here. The day the tsunami hit was actually graduation day and the messages of students still remain on faded blackboards, as well as a graduation banner above the almost completely destroyed assembly hall. The only section of the school that remains untouched is the second story, now preserved with images of the fateful day, including the chalkboard with messages from well-wishers and self-defense forces who camped at the school in the days following the disaster. And while the tsunami took the lives of over 19,000 people in just one day, several kilometers from Ukedo school, it was the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant that was to unleash long-term misery on those who survived the tragedy of March 11. When the Daiichi plant was flooded, it caused an explosion that showered a radioactive cloud across a huge expanse of land, with the government setting up a 20-kilometer exclusion zone around the perimeter of the plant. And now, 12 years later, much of the area still has restricted access. In 2018, the government announced they planned to decontaminate 660 hectares over a period of five years. Given much of Fukushima is mountainous and covered in forests, decontamination is difficult and impractical. But for decontaminated areas, progress has certainly been encouraging. So we've got a Geiger counter here, and you know we're about five kilometers from the Daiichi nuclear reactor, and it's registering 0.16 microsieverts per hour, which is about the same as Tokyo, and actually half of London. So right here, radiation levels are pretty stable. However, on the way here, when we were driving, we took kind of a mountain route, and it went to about two microsieverts there, which is still pretty low, but uh, high by the standards 
of background radiation. And that is the area that has yet to be cleaned up. They haven't removed the topsoil, and that is why in those areas, when you're driving through them, you're not really allowed to stop the car or get out um, because they are taking those safety precautions. But um, yeah, it's pretty crazy to be this close to the reactor and see the figures that low and encouraging. Despite reassuring numbers on the Geiger counter, it can only do so much to relay what it's like to return to the area affected by the disaster. With that in mind, I decided to visit the Fukushima Disaster Memorial Museum, opened in 2020, with the intention of collecting and storing evidence of Fukushima's path to recovery. It's here I meet Wakana Yokoyama, a former student of Ukedo Elementary School who escaped the tsunami and who now works as a kataribe storyteller, using her own personal experience in the hopes it may save the lives of future generations. だし自身は そんな子たちに私が伝えたいことは、みんなはその時命を落とさないようにちゃんと避難をするんだよ。自分もちゃんと避難できるようにして、で、さらに周りの人に広めてほしいなと思っています。もしおじいちゃんとおばあちゃん
come to this region, would you, would you encourage people to come here and have a look for themselves? Uh, of course, because it's fun. I mean, mm. especially young people, mm. they are stifled in this country. Young people gather here and try new things uh, for the community, for the town, for the revitalization. Mm. So I do encourage especially young people to come here and express themselves uh, taking on new ventures. Mm. I think for me, coming here, it is really inspirational, seeing all the things going on, seeing all yes. the changes. It'll be interesting to come back again in five years and yeah. see where the region is at. But um, thank you so much today thank you. for your time, Takahashi-san, and best of luck much. with everything. Chatting with Takahashi-san, I'm reminded by the sheer task that lies ahead for the area of the exclusion zone. And for the last leg of my trip, I decided to head back to the town of Tomioka, one of the area's worst affected towns. In the previous documentary, much of the most striking imagery I saw was in Tomioka. Buildings cordoned off with signs warning about radiation, earmarked for demolition, and a school playground inhabited only by a singular Geiger counter, numbers ominously displayed in the distance. I'd been given some hope that the town's residents would soon be returning after rigorous decontamination efforts. However, after four years, it still seems the town remains mostly uninhabited, save for the many workers who can be seen digging, cleaning and excavating the local area. This pharmacy is actually the opening shot of the documentary I did four years ago. And for me, it was a really kind of powerful image when I walked down this road, seeing something that's there to help people, give the medicine, cordoned off with a very dangerous sign warning about radiation. And that's why it became the opening image of the video. You know, it's been a really surreal day coming back to the Fukushima exclusion zone, the first time in four years. First half of the day in Namie, you wouldn't even know anything happened for the most part. The buildings had all been reconstructed, the farm looked nice, Takahashi's farm was great, and meeting Yokoyama-san, having a chat about the future. It very much felt like a thing that happened in the past. And then we came south here to Tomioka. Right away, you know, lots of overgrown buildings, cars run down, buildings destroyed. It kind of reminded me that this is a very long process, a process that's already gone on for like over 12 years. $200 billion spent, thousands of people working on this. Um, there's still a long way to go. And nothing about Fukushima is, is ordinary. And I would strongly recommend people to come here and have a look for themselves, meet the people. I think you'll be both horrified by it all, but above all inspired. We did make an in-depth documentary four years ago on this channel, you can check it out, about the Fukushima exclusion zone. But for now, guys, we continue our journey tomorrow across Tohoku in North Japan, 21 days on the road, and we see Ryotaro for the first time in a while. So check that out, we'll see you there. But for now, guys, many thanks for joining. See you there.